Good morning, afternoon, evening, and welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents, a new offering on Village TV. Concerned Citizens of Laguna Woods is an organization committed to peace, social justice, economic equality, and a clean environment. For the duration of the lockdown, instead of its usual two meetings a month, Concerned Citizens will broadcast two programs a month on this channel. Our programs will feature films, lectures, and debates on topics related to our mission. We hope you enjoy today's program. Welcome to Concerned Citizens Presents. My name is Suzanne Modell, and I co-chair the committee responsible for these broadcasts. At long last, Concerned Citizens has begun holding meetings in person. Consequently, Concerned Citizens Presents now has two sources for its programming. Remote presentations like this one and rebroadcasts of speakers presenting live to our membership. Wonderful as it is to have a live expert in our midst, Concerned Citizens is pleased also to be able to bring you insights from experts around the globe. Today, we bring you a conversation with Katherine Weininger, a political scientist who teaches at Western Washington University. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. Katherine Weininger is an expert on right-wing women a native Californian. She was actually born in our neighboring town of Laguna Hills. She received her BA at UC San Diego and her PhD at Rutgers. This year, Oxford University Press published her book, Gendering the GOP, Intra-Party Politics and Republican Women's Representation in Congress. Professor Weininger has done research on the ways our two political parties do and don't encourage female ca candidates, on the challenges associated with being a non-white congresswoman, and on the similarities and differences between a US congressman and a woman in Britain's House of Commons. Fascinating topics, no doubt. I asked Catherine to join us today because I feel that around the time that Trump was elected, the number of visible, vocal, right-wing women began to grow. To be sure, conservative women were active during the Bush administration, but they seemed much more prominent under the Trump administration. Given that Trump's policies and his person were so antagonistic to gender equality, how is it that so many smart, well-educated, professional women support him? And the trend continues. Just in the last few days, the names receiving media attention include Marsha Blackburn, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Christy Nome, Sidney Powell, Elise Stefanik, and of course, Jenny Thomas. So Catherine, Concerned Citizens hopes you, an expert on women in right-wing politics, can help us understand this paradox. But to begin, uh, we need a little background. So could you please give our viewers some information about, perhaps some statistics about how women are doing in the political sphere? Sure, well, thank you so much for inviting me. I'm excited to be here. Um, so, a lot of records have been broken actually these past couple of election cycles, right? Obviously we have our first woman uh, and woman of color vice president. We have a record breaking 12 women serving in cabinet and cab cabinet level positions. We have three women on the Supreme Court. Maybe that'll be four soon. Um, and in Congress in particular, 27.1% uh, of the seats are filled by women. Um, we also have, um, we also saw, you know, this past couple of election cycles, the election of the youngest woman, the first Native American women, the first Muslim women, etc. Um, at the state level, there's a little bit more variation between states, but in general, about 31% of all state legislators are women. Um, and we see similar trends at the local level with about 30% of women in local government. Um, 
being women um, in, in cities with populations over 10,000. So um, these numbers have gradually been increasing over time. Certainly we're still not at that 50% mark. Um, and we saw a spike in the you know, 1992 year of the woman um, and also in 2018, which has been called this other year of the woman. Um, and then in 2020, we actually saw a record number of Republican women elected to Congress. Um, but overall, there has been sort of a pretty slow um, and steady increase um, over time. Um, that said, there is a partisan gap so while this was a really significant year for Republican women, right, Republican women in the House gained record numbers, um, most women in elected office are Democrats. Um, in Congress, for example, there are 106 Democratic women and only 39 Republican women. In the House, women are about 40% of the Democratic caucus, so almost to that 50% mark, and um, they are about 16% of the Republican conference. So really big sort of disparities there. Also 90% of all women of color in the house are Democrats. So there are these, um, there are these partisan gaps that exist that I think um, are, important to, uh, are important to understand um, and can help us, I think, give us some context into the current state of the Republican party. Great. Okay, so so then if I understand correctly, what you're saying is that I am conf I am confusing uh, the general growth of women in the political sphere with Republican increase. In other words, you there's a time trend that Democratic women are growing too, or even perhaps faster. But somehow what's attracted my attention uh, is the, the women on the conservative side. I think I think that's right. So definitely we are seeing increases among Democratic women in 2018, especially we saw a pretty big jump um, and women of color were the ones driving that increase in the number of overall women's representation. And we're just not seeing those sort of same numbers on the Republican side. But I think you're right that the prominence um, and the visibility of conservative Republican women has increased over time. Um, and so one of the things that I argue in my book is that that's not really a coincidence, right? That because there are, there's a lot of visibility of women in the, on the Democratic side of the aisle and there have been sort of active attacks um, on the Republican party as this sort of anti-woman party, that party leaders are incentivized and Republican women themselves are incentivized to uh, be more visible in the party. And so it, it isn't surprising to me that you're noticing a lot of more conservative Republican women um, on the news, um, you know, as visible party messengers, um, because that is sort of one strategy to try to paint the Republican party as you know, to try to combat these attacks against the Republican Party as this anti-woman party. Aha, uh -huh. okay. It also occurs to me that, uh, this is really more a question to you, that uh, in general, I would say that um, in America, not necessarily everywhere, the right wing um, is definitely more aggressive um, and more vocal uh, and, and perhaps grabs more media attention uh, than the left wing. So, uh, so when women kind of join that, that chorus, it may be that I have a stilted view because, because a lot of the, uh, the relatively small number of these very active Republican women are very vociferous. And they're, perhaps their Democratic uh, counterparts are a little less aggressive or you know, a little more moderate in their in their approach and therefore don't quite get as much media time is that possible i think that's definitely true there have been studies that show that more extreme politicians on both the left and the right do um, get more airtime um so and i definitely think that we are seeing increases in conservative republican women being elected to congress and i think there has been a push both by those women and by party leaders to get uh more conservative women in front of television cameras uh so i definitely think that that visibility has increased over time 
Okay, that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. Fine. Well, that, that that's an important corrective. I thank you for that. Uh, so now, now with this backdrop, um, so you have done a lot of research and spoken with a lot uh, of Republican women. Uh, could you tell us something about uh, their backgrounds? Um, could we uh, uh, find any differences in uh, either? You know, uh, well, probably, definitely. You've already meant. You've already touched on on race. And, and ethnicity or suggested that uh, minority women are, are, are more likely uh, to be democratic. So maybe let, let's set that aside. What about uh, parts of the country or apparent social class? Or I, I'm thinking, let's start for, with the family background, not, not the person's present, but the person's past. Do you have any sense that the roots, the families uh, that raise and bring these uh, Republican activist women as compared to Democratic activist women are there some differences yeah so i i am not sure and i'm not 100 percent sure in terms of the socialization aspect i will say that uh socialization certainly plays a role in everyone's you know political ideology and the development of their political ideology and their partisan affiliation um so uh, i think having conservative parents certainly matters, but we also see, you know, a lot of uh, progressive activists with conservative parents as well. Um, so, um, so the, I think the upbringing certainly matters. Um, I think religion matters um, and certainly race, um, certainly uh, education levels. For instance, we know that um, higher education um, is correlated with ideology with folks who have sort of um, college and post-grad experience being more likely to be liberal. Um, so we do have uh, those sorts of um, correlations with those sorts of social demographics. Um, and certainly, again, I think the way that folks are socialized um, from the time that they're kids and then especially, you know, um, in more like formative years, um, you know, from like 18 to like 25, we see um, that sort of um, political socialization um, really, um, really taking place. Um, and so I'm not sure that it's um, so much different for, um, you know, progressives and conservatives, um, but uh, we definitely see conservative women having sort of uh, different, um, you know, different understanding. So for instance, uh, conservative women who voted for Trump um, are more likely to hold what are called gender nationalist views. So that means that they believe America has become too soft and feminine, right? So like a preservation of traditional gender roles and masculinity is one thing that drives conservative women's political behavior. Um, so that's that's sort of right. But but there again, we have the paradox, don't we? Because uh, these these women are themselves out there advocating in the yep. limelight and so forth for for policies that say that say that they should stay home yeah exactly yeah there there is that paradox and i think uh ronnie schreiber talks a lot about that that paradox right that um advocating for traditional gender roles and yet being out in the public right, right. um and so one way that i think conservative women uh deal with that uh, paradox is by when they're out in the public, really sort of leaning on their identities as mothers, um, as as a way to um, credential themselves as true conservatives, right? And then acting from that space. Okay, well, let's not let's not quite go there yet. Let's stay, a, good. <laughs> stay a little bit more first on on who they are. Um, so so uh, my my sense. Uh, uh, is that uh, people get some uh, identity and ideologies uh, from their from their home, from their family background, um, but then um, uh, all of us uh, who choose a partner, uh, actually men or women, are influenced by uh, the perspectives of our partners. And I don't know um, whether you can say that. Uh, in a very general sense, it's perhaps difficult to know. But you you have done a detailed study um, of a, of a actually short term, but perhaps returning legislator uh, named Mia Love, mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I she might actually be an interesting case study just to discuss a minute because. Um, 
I wonder if you might uh, tell us a little bit about Mia and about how the contrast between her family of origin, um, her her spouse and you know current family, and how that has all come together uh, to create her ideology. Yeah, so I, I will say, so I did do a case study on Mia Love. Uh, Mia Love, uh, for those of you who might not know, is the was the first Black Republican woman elected to Congress. Um, she was elected in 2014, I believe, and then um, and then was um, uh, was uh, you know basically lost her her reelection. Um, and I looked at in that study, I really looked at trying to understand. You know, the study is called How Can a Black Woman Be a Republican? Um, and it was based on a comment that she had received at um, a political event where she was asked that question. And so that became part of her um, campaign, um, uh, her sort of campaign narrative, right? Was, uh, yes, I am a Black woman and I'm a Republican and this is how. Um, and so, um, you know, uh, Mia Love is, an, I think, a, an interesting um, uh, person because she sort of converted to uh, Mormonism. Um, and so her religion, um, you know, her, her, her partner, her um, husband is, uh, was a Mormon member of the Church of Latter-day Saints. Um, and so her ideology um, was really shaped by um, her living in Utah, her religion, um, her motherhood. And so that paper really looked at sort of how she was able to um, work within the context of her political ideologies, her co very conservative stances on various issues, as well as her social um, identities, like, you know, being uh, converted, uh, like converting to, to Mormonism, um, and how yeah. that sort of shaped how she, um, how that shaped how she presented herself then on the campaign trail. Uh, but Kathleen, could you tell us a little bit about where she came from? You said that she converted, yeah. but what yeah. were her roots? I honestly can't, uh, now I can't remember. I, I believe oh. she came from, um, I, I believe she was oh. from New York. So she's, ha she's Haitian, right? Um, but she, um, but uh, in terms of, I think she was in, I want to say she was in New York. Um, she's in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, yeah. She's from Brooklyn, then, which is where the the largest Afro-Caribbean uh, right, community, although exactly. not the largest Haitian, the largest Haitian community is yep. in Miami, but exactly. she, she was certainly not in a conservative part no. of the country. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right. And um, and yeah, and so I think, um, and, and so you do see that ideology sort of shifting um, over time, I think, and definitely ideology can be socialized. Um, um, in, in those ways. Right. Yeah, well, I, I really did think that was it was very interesting. Uh, I mean, it is certainly possible uh, that she did come from uh, a conservative family. I think yep. her parents uh, were uh, right. sort of semi-refugees and they may have been relatively elite in, in, in Haiti mm -hmm. and it, it's hard to know. Um, yeah. But still, uh, to, uh, to become a Mormon when you are a Haitian mm -hmm. refugee is... Um, Quite a shift, I, I can right. reassure that. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if if that happens uh, not infrequently. Uh, you know that people move uh, uh, further uh, in, uh, into extreme positions if their spouse uh, endorses. Uh, they, sure. It's a kind of a mutual reinforcement. Whereas if the spouse does not, it, it becomes more difficult. And I, I actually think that that, that works uh, for men, you know, as well as women, that people, people are, are in, influenced by uh, uh, mostly their parents. And then, and then after that, I would say their partners. Right. So, um, okay, so we, we perhaps their backgrounds uh, may uh, are either originally or more recently kind of reinforcing uh, a political preference of one side or the other. So um, can we talk a little bit then about, about uh, conservative women's policy preferences? I'm sure that, there, that there's some uh, diversity among them, but uh, actually one thing that, that strikes a congressional watcher uh, with some consistency is uh, the Republicans seem to be much more uh, congruent uh, in their policies and in their votes and so forth. Uh, the Democrats uh, uh, seem to have a lot of trouble holding, holding their people together. So yeah. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about the kinds of positions that 
uh, the, the average, uh, uh, let's say, Republican congresswoman takes, uh, mm -hmm. maybe starting with, with family, uh, with women and family issues, because that's where, where, for many of us, we feel there's a bit of a disconnect. What can you tell yeah. us, Catherine? Yeah, so I, I do think that there's definitely variation in Republican women's policy preferences. Um, so in terms of Congress, um, I will say that uh, Michelle Swers and Karen Larson, uh, they identified three Republican women archetypes in Congress. Um, and so I'll just go through those and, and tell you a little bit how they have shifted over time. So the first is the feminist Republican woman. Um, and it might sound weird, I think, in today's political environment, but there are definitely Republican women who identify as feminists and who tend to support at least some of the issues that we'd consider to be feminist women's issues, right? So pro-choice, pro-family leave, pro-equal pay, et cetera. Um, the second archetype is the woman who denies gender differences. So these women um, deny the existence of quote unquote women's issues or women's interests and sort of just say, you know, everything applies equally to everyone. They're not really concerned about working on uh, these quote unquote women's issues. And then the third archetype is uh, the socially conservative women. So these are conservative women who embrace their womanhood, um, who embrace traditional gender roles like motherhood, um, and who take uh, conservative stances on fiscal and social issues. And what we've seen over time is an increase in socially conservative women running as Republican candidates and winning seats in Congress. So the Republican women in Congress today uh, are definitely more conservative than the Republican women in Congress two decades ago, for example. Um, Republican women in Congress are also more uh, ideologically in line with the Republican men in Congress, and that wasn't always the case. We did used to sort of see, um, you know, Republican women, for instance, in the 80s and 90s, being a more moderating force for the party, um, and we're really not seeing that anymore, generally speaking, right? They're very much in line with the party. They're very much touting those um, uh, Republican policy preferences. Um, and part of this is because of what um, political scientists call ideological sorting. So over the past few decades, we've seen people who are more consistently liberal sorting themselves into the Democratic Party and people who are more consistently conservative sorting themselves into the Republican Party. So we're getting sort of more ideologically homogenous parties um, on both sides. Um, although I think you're right that the Republican Party is more homogenous, and that has to do more with people's social identities, right? So the Democratic Party is made up of people with um, uh, various social identities, and we're trying to, the Democratic Party is, you know, really trying to figure out, okay, how do we balance all of these different, different interests from different social groups? And the Republican Party is more homogenous socially. Um, and therefore it can be more homogenous ideologically. So one of the reasons for this is that, you know, in the 1970s, 80s and 90s, we saw Republican, the Republican Party engage um, in the Southern strategy. So mobilizing white voters through, for example, the use of dog whistle politics. We also saw more explicit catering to the religious right in the 1990s, you know, with the George W. Bush administration for in, uh, or George Bush administration and George W. Bush administration in the early 2000s, um, and an explicit rejection um, of uh, feminist policies. So in 1980, the Republican Party removed support of the Equal Rights Amendment from their platform. It included explicitly anti-abortion stances in their platform. So what we have seen is white Christian, socially conservative men and women moving into the Republican Party and feminist Republicans moving out of the party slowly over time. So we're getting these more homogenous parties. Right. Um, I, I think that's an excellent description uh, of what's going on. And I love the point about uh, that because the Democrats are 
I would call it demographically diverse. They have women and men, they have blacks and Latinos, uh, and, and, therefore, and, and uh, therefore naturally uh, these people bring different perspectives to uh, the solution of America's problems. But if you're primarily white Christian, uh, it, the diversity is, is uh, substantially less. Although not that not, it's not zero, but uh, particularly with the abortion issue, I would say uh, that that has given uh, Catholics and evangelical Protestants some, some solid ground for merging. So, uh, so right. that's, 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 that's very, but uh, speak, speaking a little bit of Catholicism, I'm just, I don't know if you can answer this question, but um, many of us, of course, as you know, are worried about about losing the right to abortion or states having uh, control over abortion rather than the federal government. One of the things I've noticed, for example, uh, in the views of, of Marsha Blackburn, um, and uh, I'm not sure that there aren't others like her, is some danger towards uh, the right to con contraception. Um, and I wondered if, if you were aware at all of whether uh, we should be worried, not whether there's some kind of a movement that is uh, going to be or has already started stigmatizing it's not enough to get rid of abortion. Uh, we need to limit access to contraception in any way. Is that? Yeah, yeah I actually don't know um, the answer to that question. Um, I will say uh I could see that happening um, and being framed as sort of more like a personal choice, personal responsibility type of thing, right? Where like access to contraception um, is not as available, um, but I'm, I'm not sure. And there might be sort of a movement towards that. Um, it wouldn't necessarily surprise me, but. Well, that, that would really keep women home, wouldn't it? Right. <laughs> what about, okay, what about other, uh, uh, the kinds of issues um, in the in the Republican, uh, I mean, in the in the political frame, like uh, you know, issues like uh, guns uh, or or the defense budget. Um, uh, you you mentioned is it also the case that that on these non gender family issues uh, that uh, Republican women uh, do they do they join Republican men uh, in you know nixing gun control or uh, opposing uh, uh, any kind of assistance for uh, health care, you know, Obama or anything like that, mm -hmm. or bigger defense budgets, more warlike uh, yeah. you know, trade wars. Are they are they are the two genders aligned in the Republican Party on the non feminine non family issues as well? Yeah, I think that's right. I think uh, over time, we've definitely seen um, the trend of, of, you know, Republican women and Republican men, um, you know, not really having a whole lot of uh, diversity in terms of in terms of those issues. So there aren't really gender differences uh, in terms of the types of issues that Republican men and women support. Um, and we are seeing increasingly conservative stances on those issues by both men and women. Um, and so one thing I look at in my book is I look at uh, what's called woman invoked rhetoric. Um, and so basically I looked at every time uh, Republican women talked about women on the House floor. So I wanted to see, are they framing these sort of non-women's issues as women's issues. Um, and I saw, I did see a little bit of it over time. For instance, um, we I saw uh, Marsha Blackburn, for instance, and other Republican women at the time uh, framing national security as a mother's issue, as a woman's issue, um, uh, and really sort of combating the Obama administration's you know, decisions. Um, I saw uh, gun control uh, being framed as a women's issue, right? Like, so using guns to um, protect, uh, for allowing women to protect themselves, right? Giving my, allowing my daughter to like learn how to use a gun to protect herself. Um, and so I definitely think that we, uh, Republican women are more in line with Republican men on those uh, policy stances. And they're also on top of that, in some cases, framing those issues as important to women which I think is interesting. Right. Well, in a way, I mean, I, I, I endorse that. I, I do think guns, all these things are women's sure, issues. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, just, absolutely. And I, I do see that on the Democratic side as well, right? Where, where Democrats are, are 
also saying, you know, democratic women are saying like all of these issues are women's issues. They matter to women. Um, and, uh, Republicans do the same thing, but with different ideological stances. Right. And, and different policy prescriptions. Right. Okay. So, um, so let's, let's talk a little bit about, uh, uh, how, um, uh, how Republican women uh, might might use their or use or not use. Maybe I should put it that way. Use or not use their gender um, as part of their uh, persona and part of their agenda. Um, and I'd like to start, if I may, at least I mean one way to get out this. Uh, if you could tell us a little bit about uh, what I have now come to learn is, uh, is the Mama Grizzly stance. It's not something I was familiar before with. I don't know if our viewers are familiar with Mama Grizzly, but um, it's worth discussing. Could you tell us about it? Yeah, absolutely. So the Mama Grizzly rhetoric, uh, this sort of came out of uh, that term came from Sarah Palin's, uh, you know, uh, vice presidential run. Um, and afterwards, her mobilization of like Tea Party candidates, for instance, um, and she really um, engaged um, in what now scholars call tea, uh, Mama Grizzly rhetoric. Um, and uh, so this came out of her um, out of her campaign. Um, I think I'm trying to think of like now the, the exact speech. I think it was at her convention um, uh, speech, her acceptance uh, speech, where you know she talked about um, you know you thought you thought pit bulls were 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 tough. Well, uh, let me let me tell you about the Mama Grizzly, right? And so this this is this idea, and I think a lot of conservative women sort of latched on to this Mama Grizzly rhetoric. And actually, a really great book to read if you haven't yet is um, Tea Party Women. It's by Melissa Deckman. She really goes into this idea of say it Mama again a little more carefully. The name of the oh, book it, it's uh, Tea Party Women um, by Melissa Deckman. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, she really goes into like the different types of mama grizzly rhetoric that we see, but the, essentially the, the, you know, the overarching concept is this idea that, uh, conservative women are these like fierce mothers, right. That they are protecting their children from, uh, government overreach from government intrusion, right. Um, from the government you know, taking taking guns, we see that increasingly, but also um, indebting their children, right, with like um, with government spending and that and that kind of stuff. And so we definitely have seen that type of uh, mama grizzly rhetoric increasing over time. Um, I will say that didn't this idea of framing um, Nash the national debt, for instance, as an attack on conservative women's children is not new. It didn't start with Sarah Palin. She just like coined the term mama grizzly. Um, but we have seen that type of rhetoric used um, by um, more conservative women, even in like the 1990s, for example, I find that rhetoric um, being used in um, when, when I did research for my book. Um, so that's like this idea of, of uh, mama grizzly rhetoric, this idea of using your motherhood um, in a way that aligns with the norms of the Republican Party. So still kind of sticking to this idea of traditional gender roles, right? This idea that I'm a mother, I care about my children. Um, and because of that, I'm a strong conservative, right? Because of that, I care about government overreach. I care about um, uh, my children's, you know, education and government staying out of my children's education. We're seeing that a lot of that rhetoric now, right? With like critical race theory, um, with like, um, you know, with uh, like the don't say gay bills and that kind of stuff, right? We're really seeing a lot of conservative Republican women framing this as um, government trying to tell moms and parents what to do um, with their children. Um, and I definitely think that that's one way that Republican women navigate their culture, right? By framing themselves as mothers and then using that framework to highlight um, their conservative credentials. Wow. Uh, actually, you just, to me, you just said something really, really interesting. So, so one of the I don't know if it, we could say planned or we could say um, unanticipated consequences of uh, a 
a, an emphasis on critical race theory um, would be that you know now we're talking about education and education is a realm uh, that is uh, traditionally to be to be dealt with and concerned by women uh, and, and by moms and so we we have this arena in which we can uh, justify uh, women really being you know uh, very aggressive in the, in the service of helping their protecting their children right yeah i think that's absolutely true and i definitely think that is a messaging strategy um, that we're seeing um, in the 2022 election year and probably beyond that as well Right. Uh, it's actually not not new. Uh, Concerned mm -hmm. Citizens is uh, going to have a speaker in June named uh, Elaine Lewinick, uh, and she has done she did research originally on 1960s textbook wars uh, mm -hmm. that that were held. Uh, you know, it was partly I think the John Birch Society and various groups here uh, in Southern California that that were uh, busy trying to uh, make sure that we're not uh, opposed, uh, exposed to any uh, what, what we might call anti uh, co complex American history, I would put it that way. Uh, the other point that, that's worth stressing uh, with the uh, Mama Grizzly approach, I think, is that, that um, we do have this sense that, tell me if I'm wrong, that re the Republicans are really a lot more aggressive in advancing their views uh, than Democrats are. I mean, vociferously, um, uh, unpleasantly so. Uh, um, anyone who, who's ever seen an abortion opponent standing outside of a clinic um, would be just be amazed at the, at the vitriol, at the, at the, the anger, at the rage, at, um, uh, again, uh, in the protection uh, of fetuses. Um, so what so what we have, I think, with the with the Mama Grizzly or the or the CRT is again, it's kind of an excuse uh, to not only are, are they uh, uh, protecting their children, but it gives cover to being so so really unpleasant and nasty and you know take take no survivors kind of kind of philosophy or approach. Yeah, I think that's right. I think. I think that the Republican Party, and there's been research, right, thinking about like the Republican Party as the sort of more masculine party and pe people view the Republican Party as more masculine, people view the Democratic Party as more feminine. Um, and so sort of that, um, that tone, that sort of anger um, aligns more with the Republican Party. Um, and so I think that Mama Grizzly rhetoric is a way to um, allow Republican women to adopt a more traditional gender role you know, identity, but then also from that identity engage in more, uh, in more like, like you say, anger. Um, I will say there's a very interesting piece by Holloway Sparks um, that talks about, because I, and I think this is important because it also talks, um, it, it helps us to understand the racial aspects of uh, gender politics in the party. So um, Holloway Sparks, uh, piece talks a little bit about um, how mama grizzly rhetoric um, is very rooted in white womanhood and how women of color, Republican women of color, um, can't sort of engage in that same mama grizzly rhetoric tone in the same way, because then you're stereotyped as like this angry black woman or angry woman of color, right? And I did see that in my Mia Love piece, for example, right? Where Mia Love was not engaging in mama grizzly rhetoric in the same way. It wasn't, there wasn't that anger behind it. It was much more, I'm a loving, caring mother, right? I care about my children's education, but the emotional aspect was not there in the same way that we saw it with like Sarah Palin, for instance. Um, and so then it comes, this question um, arises in terms of like, who can be a successful Republican woman candidate? And what barriers is that, does that, is that presenting for Republican women of color, right? Okay, I would, and I would like, I actually would like our discussion to move, to move right there and, and just about a minute, but there's still a couple of, of thoughts, uh, you know, that I that I have. Uh, so 
we I just want to reinforce the point you just made by reminding our viewers that we have just seen uh, the confirmation hearings for a black uh, G uh, Supreme Court candidate. And uh, again, it, it's very clear that uh, no matter how provoked and, and, and it's really actually stereotypical example of Republican rage that 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 all kinds of irrelevancies and inaccuracies um, and interruptions must be suffered by this black woman because if she were to dare uh, to stand up for herself she risks uh, supposedly or at least the general belief is and she believes it too that if she were to actually attempt just just to hold her own that that, that she would be in danger of of uh, lowering her chances of success mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think that's right i think that that stereotype is very much uh, still at play um, in American yeah. politics. Yes, yes, yes. And there's a lot of a lot of research actually that that shows um, also, um, I mean, for example, we know that uh, uh, black men, uh, uh, when we talk about interracial unions, black men are far more likely to have white partners than black women are to have white partners. Mm -hmm. And we do suspect that some of that uh, is related to uh, the sort of angry black woman stereotype that uh, somehow you know where as opposed to shall we say the asian woman uh, the docile subordinate asian woman stereotype and mm -hmm. and of course those those unions lean heavily uh in the direction of a white male and a asian female uh, but that's a social side point uh, another side point I just want to make and then I do want to move to yes to some of the research you've done and research in your books I do want our our viewers um to understand that while in the current American context, uh, the the right is is without a doubt, you know, the most the more aggressive and the more vociferous and, and the more uh, virulent uh, in expressing their views. I don't think that that means that the left is never that way. Um, I think the left in the United States is is particularly intimidated and quiet and quiescent. Uh, but I would not want uh, our viewers to think that, you know, in the course of history, or American or otherwise, or in other countries and so forth, that the left cannot be uh, just as doctrinaire and just as demanding and just as difficult and just as loud. Uh, but right now, uh, in uh, this moment, uh, and maybe for, for much of recent American history, that that is not the case. So uh, let's move on to a little bit more to your research. Um, so given given the background that we have, and as you've helped us to see the kind of uh, difficulty that uh, the Republican Party has, it wants women. Uh, we're at a time, you know, where there is some awareness amongst all of us that, you know, women are half the race and half the society and so forth. Um, so they want they want to promote them, but but they they have some difficulties doing so. So how how do female candidates get get uh, the endorsement of the Republican Party, and how how does the party go about marketing them? You've learned a lot about that. Sure. Yeah. So I I do think so. I've done a lot of uh, research in terms of trying to understand Republican women's self-presentation and then trying to understand generally like the gender dynamics within the party. I will say that um, there are a few reasons that we don't see Republican women running for office as much as Democratic women. Um, part of that is because of ideological differences. So uh, Republican women do tend to sort of be more moderate than Republican men in the general public. Um, and so uh, we have seen this sort of general trend of moderates not running for office um, as you know polarization is occurring. Um, so what's happening is that as the Republican Party moves further to the right, uh, Republican women, a lot of more moderate Republican women really don't see themselves as viable candidates. Um, the other um, issue is that um, Republican women uh, have to sort of overcome these gender stereotypes. Uh, we tend to view 
women as more liberal um, on both sides of the aisle. And so when Republican women are sort of trying to win their primary elections, they have to overcome these gender stereotypes to cater to more conservative activist bases. And then finally, the Republican Party really like rejects this concept of quote unquote identity politics, right? So um, we have seen sort of more explicit support for women candidates and in particular women of color candidates on the left through both because of party leadership and also um, as a result of women's organizations on the left sort of trying to um, elect and recruit women candidates. On the right, we also have women's organizations, but they're not as funded. And part of that is because um, Republican Party leaders, Republican Party donors don't invest in women's organizations the same way that Democratic Party donors do. Um, so there's a, really a lack of structural support. Um, so when Republican women do run, um, they really have to run um, they really have to credential themselves as conservatives in order to get that, um, uh, you know, the party endorsement in order to um, win the, the vo uh, voters in primary elections and those, those types of things. So really credentialing themselves as conservatives um, is one is one thing. Um, and then I, I have noticed a lot um, of Republican women sort of really trying to uh, uh, paint themselves as electorally beneficial for the party, right? That Republican women can help the party as a whole uh, combat these narratives that the party is this anti-woman party. Um, and so trying to, um, trying to paint themselves as uh, beneficial electorally for the party, I think is one way um, that we see Republican women um, framing themselves um, and one way that the candidates um, gain the support of party leaders. Um, so, so there's that. So that, that that's in terms of like the candidate aspect. Um, is this what you mean? I know, uh, I understand that uh, you had developed some kind of idea about partisan gender identity. Mm -hmm. uh, could yeah. You, could you tell, uh, is that what you just talked about or could you flesh that out for us a little? Sure. Yeah, I, I can definitely talk about that. So my book in particular is um, it, it focuses more on Republican women in Congress um, and how they navigate the institution of Congress as a whole and of their party in particular. So the the book, uh, for those of you who might not know, um, it the way that I conducted research for the book is I conducted interviews with women members of Congress through the Center for American Women in Politics. Um, and I also conducted uh, content analyses of House floor speeches to sort of see how Republican women's rhetoric and behavior has shifted over the past two decades. Um, and one thing that I find is that uh, political polarization and the election of more ideologically conservative women to Congress has created incentives for Republican women to work together as Republican women. So this is what I call a partisan gender identity. This is the idea that Republican women really now are viewing themselves as distinct from both Republican men and from Democratic women. Um, and so they're increasing, they are increasingly, I think, working together collectively to try to recruit, elect, and mentor more Republican women um, to elected office. Um, and that's also one of the reasons as, you know, going back to like the start of this interview um, is that's also one of the reasons we're seeing an increased visibility of more conservative women in the party in recent years, right? It's par partly it's because of the work that Republican women themselves have been putting in to make women more visible. And partly it's because party leadership understands that women messengers can be good for the electoral prospects of the party. Um, and so, um, so I have seen sort of that shift over time. So again, it's not surprising to me that you are seeing, you know, more women, more conservative women um, in, in the media um, and, you know, it, it increased prominence in recent years. Um, 
Right. Okay. Well, that, that, that's helpful. And, um, and I mean, I think that's great, actually. I mean, that's what sisterhood is about. We're supposed to uh, try to help one another and those who are already well placed to help those who would like to join them. Um, but one of the things I maybe you could talk also a little bit about is, is how the how these right wing women uh, deal with with gender um, as an as an issue, uh, which is to say, my my overall sense, just having been reading about this over the past few days, preparing for this, is that there there's uh, there's quite a difference in the way in the kind of rhetoric that that these women use. Um, when they when 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 confronted with the fact you know that they're uh, supposedly the members of a disadvantaged group um, which is to say that they present themselves as uh, what should i say gender neutral uh, they don't they don't they don't run as women uh, they, in fact they they specifically right they kind of deny that uh, that they're looking that they don't want to have any position uh, because of affirmative action or some feeling that you know it, mm -hmm. what they they're just just looking uh, for for some kind of a meritocracy. Yes, I think that's true, and I think that that has also changing a little bit. Um, over time. And so um, I, I definitely think that's true. I will say a lot of uh, the, you know, uh, the women that I interviewed, I would ask them about gender and they would say exactly what you say, right? Like that there, there aren't gender differences, it's meritocracy, my gender doesn't matter. Um, and then they would go on in the interview to sort of talk about all the ways that gender did matter, um, sort of, un, you know, unknowingly about, you know, how, you know, they were sort of, uh, there was like sort of a lack of respect by male party leaders and those, those sorts of things. Um, and so I do think that that idea exists This sort of, again, it stems from this rejection of identity politics, this idea that we're, we are sort of in this meritocracy. Um, but um, at the same time, I have seen um, women uh, engaging in gendered rhetoric on the house floor in their campaigns, talking about themselves as women, and in particular talking about themselves as Republican women and conservative women. So really trying to distinguish themselves now, um, and this is what's different from the past, is really distinguishing themselves from democratic women. And I think one of the reasons for this is that in recent years, we've really seen an increase in the prominence of um, democratic women, and in particular democratic women of color. Um, and I think that um, with that paired with increasing polarization has given Republican women an incentive to say, hey, not all women are Democrats or progressives. Like we are strong conservative women and we're gonna run on that, right? And I, so I do think that that has been shifting a little bit over time where there is this, um, that there is sort of this rejection of identity politics in general, and yet strategically they're engaging their womanhood and their uh, and their motherhood in particular um, in order to advance the party's narratives, policies, and you know messaging strategies. Well, I hear you. I, I guess I would say it sounds like a tightrope. I mean, it sounds very, right. very difficult. So on the one hand, you want to say that, well, you're not disadvantaged and you don't, you don't want to, you don't even, you don't even need a law to protect you because there isn't any discrimination out there. Uh, but then on the other hand, you, you know, you are a woman. So mm -hmm. uh, I, I wish, I wish them luck with that. It sounds complicated. Yeah. And, and so perhaps actually that maybe as a as a concluding point now so so while these women um are are uh, republican women and they they want their due as such could you tell us a little bit uh about the glass ceilings uh, that women in politics encounter and uh whether there are not indeed um what do you want to call it a lower uh, glass ceiling uh for the republican women uh and how are they how are they negotiating that might we expect uh, that they will be uh, more successful in the future uh, how's that going sure so i i think that there's a, a few things so first i think that there are republican women face um sort of bigger barriers getting into office and getting elected in, into office 
um, in part because of these ideological and cultural issues. Um, so that's one thing. And then I think once w Republican women are elected to Congress, for instance, there's a whole host of other of other issues in terms of climbing that ladder towards leadership, right? We have not had um, a woman as uh, Republican woman speaker of the house or majority leader yet, for instance, um, and Republican women have thought about running for those positions, but have um, felt that um, they were not supported by male party leaders. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I've uh, talked to Republican women who have said um, pretty explicitly that the men in the party um, really sort of feel like those positions belong to them and they don't want to give them up. So there's, there is that like male party leaders as gatekeepers happening in the, in the democratic, in the Republican party. And certainly that's the case in the democratic party a little bit too. Although I think it's not as, as much of a case. And part of that is also because of this idea of seniority. So Republican women have also had a harder time gaining seniority in the institution. And part of the reason is because, um, they're, they are more electorally vulnerable. We see um, Republican women being um, challenged both more both in general elections as well as in primary elections. Um, and Republican women sort of leaving for these reasons as well. Um, I think a lot of the people that I study in my book are no longer in Congress. Um, you know, a few of them have been primaried, for instance. Um, so ideology really, um, and the ideology of the party, I think is, a um, c continues to be a barrier for Republican women, both entering office and climbing that leadership ladder in terms of policy leadership positions. They're gaining a lot of visible messaging roles, but not so much um, in terms of policy leadership. Um, although we are seeing, um, I think in this Congress, there are three uh, women ranking members of committees in the House. So, you know, that's, a, that's, that's something, but um, seniority, I think, um, I think matters. Um, and so I guess my, the big sort of overarching, like concluding point that I would make is that um, if we want to see um, Republican women, the full spectrum of Republican women actually being represented, right? Because I think right now what we have are like these really conservative women in Congress um, being elected because we are seeing the party moving more towards the right. If we wanna see more moderate Republican women being elected and sort of shaping the party, um, that's gonna require more than just sort of like recruiting candidates and doing what the Republican women in Congress right now are doing, which I think is great. But I think in addition to that, you're going to need to actually change the culture of the party. You're going to need to, to create a Republican party that's more moderate, um, that cares more about like women's presence explicitly. Um, and um, I think doing that is going to both be, take both more internal work among party leaders, and then also potentially electoral reforms that incentivize party leaders to build a bigger tent in order to win elections, right? How are you going to be able to um, uh, mobilize and get women of color to run as Republicans, for instance, or more moderate women, Republican women to run? Um, and I think that is, again, going to, to require um, moderating the party. Great. Okay. Well, that that's a nice optimistic note that maybe <laughs> maybe the parties would come more more together. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time. Concerned citizens, thanks, Catherine Weininger, for sharing her insights with us. She has increased our understanding of how women advocate for right-wing causes and has also shown us that Republican women face many barriers, indeed, more barriers than Democratic women do. And concerned citizens, thanks you, our audience, for taking the time to watch this program. We hope you will join us for another informative broadcast next time. See you soon. <laughs>